Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning from Dallas. Um, thanks for logging in today for our IEF conservation and coffee session for our Giving Tuesday. So thanks, thank you so much for logging in. Um, we're gonna give people a couple of minutes to um, get all online here and we have a, a great uh, presentations that we're gonna be listening to today. And I wanna welcome everybody. So as we go through the sessions, um, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, as we're going through, if you have some questions for our presenters, we ask that you put the questions in the chat. And then if we have some time at the end, we might be able to open up the floor for um, people to ask questions directly to the presenters. Um, so we'll just kind of see how it goes. But once the presenters start, if you don't mind putting your cameras on, um, on off and your microphones on mute, that way we can save bandwidth because we do have some folks here on the call that are coming from various areas around the world and that will help us save on bandwidth. So again, welcome to IEF's Coffee and Conservation session for Giving Tuesday. Um, good to see so many people here on the call this morning, and um, we'll go ahead and get started with things. And I'm going to introduce Sarah Conley, our conservation coordinator at IEF, and I'll turn it over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Julie. Uh, good morning, everyone. We are so happy to have you. This is our second year celebrating Giving Tuesday by having coffee, cocktails, and conservation. You're on our morning session with coffee or tea or hot cocoa, whatever hot beverage you like. Um, we have two really great guests. Um, we have Amos Guema. He's the Principal Intelligence Officer for Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority and is responsible for all wildlife intelligence in Zimbabwe. He has 25 years experience in law enforcement, first as a police officer, then as a wildlife ranger. He has secured over 290 convictions, which is a record for any ranger in the country. He takes a community approach to conservation, seeing communities as the first line of defense against wildlife. And in 2020, he won the Tusk Wildlife Ranger of the Year Award, very prestigious. So that's our first guest. Our second guest is Charlie Gray. He's vice president of the International Elephant Foundation's board of directors. He has over 25 years of elephant experience, currently managing a multi-generational herd of Asian elephants and African lion safari in Ontario, Canada. He manages one of the largest breeding herds in North America and has more second generation births than any other facility in North America. Charlie is active in supporting elephant research projects, fighting EHV and so much more. We are so happy to have Charlie on the call and to have Charlie on our board of directors. So without further ado, we're gonna start with Amos. Uh, and as, Char as Julie said, put your questions in the chat. We will get back to them and answer them as we go. We have two incredible resources here. So I'm sure you guys will have lots of things to ask and discuss. So first, let me share Amos' slides. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. As the, the introduction from the facilitator, I think if you know more about myself, my name is Amos Guema. I'm going to present on the basics of community wildlife conservation. And uh, the organization supporting me, International Elephant Foundation, I want to say thank you very much for your support is generating a lot of interest from the community. Then Wildlife Conservation Coalition, these are local conservationists who also assist me in my community work. Then the task, they support me through the grant I won in 2020. Next slide. Next slide, please. As I as it been stated, my name is Amos Guema. 
I am a former principal intelligence and investigation officer for Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority, having worked for 17 years in the authority. For the past 17 years, Amos Gwema has been working with the community to get intelligent, and this led to the arrest of 1,221 accused persons with a cumulative sentence of 9,581 years imprisonment for offenders. Amos Gwema is a Mount Award winner of four African International Conservation Awards. You will see them in the next slide. Amos Gwema, going forward, Amos Gwema will be working with, those are the awards. The first on the left, that is the best game ranger of Africa in 2023. The one on the right, Task Award, Game Ranger of the Year 2020. Next slide. Right. Some of the work done through community support. You can get those. You, you can get the whole stories on the links shared. These are some of the selected success stories of working with the community. On the right, there are elephants drinking water along the Zambezi River. Next slide. Right. That is another trophy on the left, 2019 African Conservation Award. That is uh, from Prince Albert of Monarch Foundation. On the right, that is 2022 Conservation Award from Zimbabwe Conservationists. Next slide. What could be done to improve wildlife conservation? Community support. I always say the community is the first line of defense for effective wildlife conservation. The success and achievements came from the community. Actually, 98% of the arrests and recoveries was from the community. As a payback to the community in 2024, I will set up a center on a two hectare land named Community Conservation Trust. And I want to advise the audience that already there is a ball, there is four runs, and the, those funds came from International Elephant Foundation. Info, information about wildlife conservation will be shared to community members, day visitors, school children, and anyone keen to know about wildlife conservation. Women and less privileged will be supported with income generating skills, e.g. supported with resources to start poverty alleviation projects, e.g. chicks, goats, pigs. At the center, there shall be a HR, which will be used a solar power. Experts will be invited from conservationists, government, academia to deliver lectures at the Community Conservation Trust Center. Next slide. community and donor support. On the left shows support for protected area. On right shows accommodation for villagers adjacent to park and nothing for community support from the millions of dollars donated. This is the gap which I am trying to bridge. Conservationists and other organizations, they tend to support protected areas leaving the communities vulnerable. As you can see from those two articles, a lot of money was pumped into the park for wildlife conservation, but from all those millions, nothing for the community. As you can see, the living conditions of the community. So the Community Conservation Trust Center will aim to transform villagers to have self-sustenance. Next slide. More suggestions to improve wildlife conservation training. There is inadequate rudimental training of law enforcement officials on informal management and handling, interviewing and interrogation techniques, docket compilations, human rights, etc. The save the community trusted will host the community 
all life trust host what life law enforcement officials for training on some of the above subjects. This will also help the wildlife officials to come closer to the people and help in the interactions with the community members. Funding will be requested from TASC, UK International Elephant Foundation and other interested organizations who can support community conservation efforts. Community members and school children will also be trained on basics of wildlife conservation, especially those who will be going for school tour of Wangi National Park, Victoria Falls, ETC. Next slide. Acknowledgement. I would like to thank the following for being the pillars of my achievement, and I wish if they continue supporting my conservation in Duvas. The Journey Trust, Mr. Trevor Lane in particular, and his team, Save the African Rhino Foundation, Mr. Doc Nicholas Dungan in particular, and his team, International Elephant Foundation, Sarah Conley in particular and her team. And I want to emphasize on International Elephant Foundation. They are the ones who have helped in the establishment of the Community Conservation Trust Center. The task and all other stakeholders mentioned below. I want to thank them all for the support. Next slide. Let me quote, let me say this. You, can, you can't change the people around you, but you can change the people around you. This community conservation center will try to change the people around so that the people can conserve wildlife. As you can see, if we join hands together, we can conserve all our wildlife, the trees, the environment, etc. Next slide. Conclusion. This presentation is very special to me. Today is my birthday. I want to set the record straight that I am still committed to wildlife conservation full time and I'm available at any time to make presentations on what I have learned about wildlife conservation. Now I have all the time to effectively contribute to wildlife conservation. Let me quote. Dr. Jenny Godow, when we put local communities at the heart of conservation, we improve the lives of people, animals, and, and the environment. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, International Elephant Foundation, for the support of the community project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amos. That was great. And I think a lot of people are going to be interested in more details about your work. Uh, and I know we all wish you a very happy birthday. Thank you for Thank joining you us much. on such an important day. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so I think we will switch over to our other speaker so that we can get all of our information out there and then open it up to questions. So Charlie, I am going to share your slides and then you can take it away. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, I'm Charlie Gray. Um, I'm one of the founding board members of the International Elephant Foundation. Um, we will soon be celebrating our 25th year. Um, International Elephant Foundation has always been very, very special and important to me. And um, I'm really proud of the work that we've been able to do and the achievements that we've been able to, um, to make. And um, I think we've contributed quite a bit to elephant conservation worldwide. And just a little bit about my background and um, what I do as my nine to five. Um, I work at African Lion Safari in Cambridge, Ontario, Canada. And we have um, a herd of 17 Asian elephants. Um, I've been here uh, with the elephants for over 35 years. 
and um, we've we've had a very successful breeding program for Asian elephants. Um, we've had 25 uh, babies born um, since 1991. Uh, you can do the next slide, Sarah. And um, we're we're real proud of that. Um, we've we've bred elephants to the second and the third generation in Canada. And our elephants are very acclimated to our, our seasons and um, they do very well here. You can show the next slide too, after everybody's seen the baby elephants. Um, one of the big things that, that we think is very important to elephant conservation is that as a young child, um, I became very interested in elephants and, and by seeing them in person and, and just the impact they had on me as such amazing animals really um, made me want to work with elephants, made me want to you know, conserve elephants. Uh, just there's nothing like it. Um, you can watch a video, you can see them on TV. Um, but seeing an elephant, smelling an elephant, just being in their presence really makes an impact on our visitors here. And we think that connecting our visitors with the elephants, you know, makes them care about elephants for future generations as well. And so that's, that's really what drives us and makes us want to do more and more for conservation of elephants worldwide. So the next slide. Um, so a little bit about our, our breeding program here. We've, um, we've got excellent genetic diversity. We've had um, babies born from seven different sires and eight different dams. Um, so our genetic diversity, we've been able to maintain very, very good genetic diversity in our herd of elephants. Uh, next slide. Um, our elephants, like I said, they are very acclimatized to our seasons in southern Ontario. Um, we have a very large park, uh, and the elephants have access to over 300 acres of diverse forests with lakes and streams and ponds um, and fields and woods. So, so they have a, a, a very diverse uh, environment that they that they live in. So. Next slide. All the female elephants born at African Lion Safari have remained at the park as part of a family. And it's real similar to the composition of, of a herd you would see in, in Asia. Um, so we have mothers and uh, daughters, granddaughters, aunts, nieces. Um, so they're very, very close. And, and that's something that we we strive to do is to to make very good social bonds with you with the our herd of elephants so next slide please um when we do have male elephants male elephants um if you know anything about the social structure of of especially asian elephants um as male elephants start to mature um they become a little bit more, um, uh, not as, as integral to the, the herd structure and they sort of drift off in the wild and they'll, they'll form loose associations, um, sometimes referred to as bachelor herds. Um, and they do have social bonds, but they're not really uh, matriarchal bonds or, or bonds with their female siblings. Um, so we have um, transferred some of our male elephants that were born in the park uh, to other institutions uh, throughout the world. And they've been able to contribute to breeding programs um, in other uh, zoos and wildlife facilities uh, throughout Europe and North America. Next slide, please. We also do a lot of um, uh, research and mostly in uh, reproduction, um, but we have done research in other, other fields as well. 
um, some of the slides you see here. Um, we've done a lot of work with um, ultrasonography where we've been able to monitor pregnancies um, and, and see the development of a uh, fetal elephant in a, all the way up until about um, 200 days of gestation. And then it just gets too big by that point to, to really visualize much, than, much more than just different parts of the elephant. We've also been involved in uh, artificial insemination projects, both here at the park and um, in other zoos and wildlife facilities um, throughout the world. Uh, so that's a good way to spread genetic diversity without actually having to move the animal. So uh, next slide, please. Um, we do have a dedicated staff. Um, and we really think that that you know we can contribute quite a bit to elephants worldwide by by just our work with the elephants and here and learning as much as we can about them. So uh, next slide, please. Um, we do also uh, involve ourselves in the greater elephant community out there. Um, both through the International Elephant Foundation and other collaborations that we've we've had throughout the years, um, as far as uh, technology transfer and um, capacity building, and and just being able to to share what we've learned um, about our elephants, and then learn from others um, that have experience in different fields with elephants as well. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a slide so showing some of the research partnerships that we've we've established over the years with different universities and, and research institutions. Um, again, that's been pretty much worldwide, um, from Japan to Africa to um, Germany, all over North America, all over. Europe basically as well. So um, we are very, very committed to research and learning and um, just making the world a better place for, for elephants through our elephant herd here at African Lion Safari. So, um, and that's pretty much it. And thank you. And I really appreciate the opportunity to sort of talk about a little bit about what we do. Thank you, Charlie. That was really interesting. And I know everyone really enjoys all the pictures of the baby elephants, which you have many. So that's pretty great. Um, so now we're going to open it up to questions. So everyone, please put your questions in the chat. I know that there's a lot that everyone covered. So I'm going to kick it off. Um, both Amos and Charlie. From my perspective, I see that you're both very committed to elephant conservation. And even though one of you's working in a range country and one of you's working, um, which we consider ex situ, you both seem to be connecting people and communities with elephants in order to do conservation. So would you guys like to talk about that, talk about the importance of connecting people to inspire that conservation energy and that conservation effort? Um, I, I guess I try to, to look at it with our visitors here um, and, and basically anybody that I talk to about elephants is um, try to put myself in, in the shoes of, I, trying to inspire people to to really care about the elephants and and you know it's it, it, it just if you can if you can spark that interest i think you can really you know generate a lot of of support for conservation and and the more you can talk about it and the more that you can expose them 
to how unique and and wonderful elephants are, the the, the better it is. Absolutely, Amos. What what's your perspective on that? I know you work with communities a lot, so you'd like to connect people. Amos, are you there? I think we may have lost him, although. I think we may have lost Amos. Yeah. Okay. Well, while we wait for Amos to get back, uh, Charlie, we do have a question in the chat. One of our supporters is asking what your greatest challenge is working in Ontario. Um, I, I don't think I have a uh, really I think the challenges of working with elephants are pretty similar wherever you are. Um, I think the big the big challenge is that it really takes a lot of dedication and a lot of sacrifice to really, um, you know, do um, the best job you can for elephants, and so it, it it's. It's not just a job. It's not just um, something you do to earn a paycheck. It's the, the, it's a real commitment and a real um, lifestyle and a real um, just way of life because the elephants basically have to come first. So I think that's the biggest challenge is is to find find people that are that are that passionate and willing to 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 put in the time and then to to support them as well. I think that's that's a big challenge. Absolutely. I think we have Amos back. Amos, are you here? Uh-oh. We may have lost him again. Oh, I think we did. Bummer. Okay. Well, continuing on with Charlie, we have a few more questions. People sure know about the weather in Canada. Do you have a threshold mm -hmm. for the lower temperatures for the elephants? Uh, what kind of, oh, hold on. Amos, are you back? I think you need to unmute. I see you. Yes. There you go. I'm Yay. big now. I lost your signal a bit. <laughs> well, I'm glad we have you back. Let me throw a question to you and then Charlie will circle back to you. Um, yes. Amos, so we've yes. been talking about connecting people with elephants and how much dedication it takes, how it's more than just a job with a paycheck. Um, do you want to talk about your conservation approach, how you make community connections in order to help elephants? Yeah, definitely, yes. Uh, I am trying my best to connect the community with the elephant conservation. Like uh, recently, I think I shared with you a story of um, a community member who was uh, trampled by an elephant. So what I do with the, the little from uh, International Elephant Foundation, we bought few groceries for, um, for the deceased family. And we supported, I think we, I supported with about 200, something about 200 USD. And the community really appreciate, and they appreciated that the person can die through any means. So it is very rare for conservationists to participate in those activities. Like I had offered uh, my truck assist in the funeral, but fortunately, uh, the employer will meet those costs. So those are some of the issues whereby we say, yes, even if it was not an elephant, the person probably was going to die. So I connect the community so that the community will say, the elephants, they belong to them as well, because they see some of the benefits they generate from those wildlife was in Zimbabwe, the elephants, they move from protected area 
into the community. So you find most of like this dry season, Amos, I think you may have frozen. Yes. Oh, there you are. You're back. So, in short, that is something which I do at a small scale, which helps the community to understand the importance of elephant and other wildlife. Excellent. So, in your experience, you have found that the more help you give the community, the more understanding they have toward wildlife and the more willing they are to help protect them. Definitely, yes, because they will say the elephants or the wild animals is our elephants, is our wildlife. If you don't support them, they say the elephants or the wildlife is for the government, it's not for the community. So you see how it changes their mentality. The aim is to is to the mentality that the elephants belongs to us all, not to the government. And that makes perfect sense. The more ownership that people feel over the wildlife, the more they're, they'd be willing to protect them. Uh, Definitely and, is. And I think that goes for where you are and where Charlie is, because everyone's working together to have people feel connected to those elephants. That's correct. Wonderful. Uh, so let's go more to the questions in the chat. Charlie, I was starting to ask you about temperatures in Canada. How do you shelter your elephants when things get cold? Do they have a barn that they stay in? Things like that. People are very interested in, in snow yeah. and elephants. Yeah, we do have, we have a heated, um, it's 16,000 square foot um, heated elephant barn. Um, that the elephants have access to, um, but our elephants are very acclimated to our, our weather. Um, in southern Ontario, um, we don't get really extreme temperatures, um, and it's not for very long periods of the, of the year, um, but also we really monitor our elephants very closely. We, we have um, We've discovered a lot of uh, very interesting things that that elephants are very adaptable to colder temperatures. We we monitor them with uh, uh, infrared thermography, so we we can get temperature readings on every part of their body and see how they do react in different um, temperatures and. It's interesting because as our elephants, we get into the second and third generation, um, our elephants, they become much more acclimatized to the, to the temperatures. And when we have a snowfall here, the, especially the young elephants, they're like kids on a snow day. They, they just, they love going out and playing in the snow and they're pretty impervious to to the temperatures and having a big area where they can run around and, and generate a lot of their own heat that seems to to work real well too so yeah they don't really have much problem with our temperatures here that's great it sounds like you're the one having to call them in not them wanting to come out of the cold yeah yeah that's <laughs> that's true it's it's you know um they they definitely have their you know they have control of the situation and and if they want to come into the barn when it's cold they they can they can do that for sure awesome okay so we have another question that i think will work for both of you um ief is asked very frequently how does someone get an opportunity to work either directly with elephants or at a wild animal park or in conservation uh in africa doing field conservation. So what advice would either of you give to someone who wants to do what you do? Right, I can start? Yes, please. Yes. Right, with me, I actually looking forward to host those people. That's why I say I'm going to have the Community Conservation Trust Center so that I will be able to work with those volunteers in Zimbabwe 
they are most welcome and uh, also working with the wildlife conservation coalition we've got access to the national park with access to the protected areas so those volunteers are most welcome in zimbabwe uh, the community conservation trust center we have some accommodation facilities for such people to have a first hand experience on African elephant conservation. So the door is open to Zimbabwe. We are most welcome. So just get to Zimbabwe and Amos to take care of you guys. <laughs> That's correct. Um, wonderful. What a what an incredible invitation for people interested in learning what you do. Um, Charlie, what about you? Well, I, I think, um, you know, if you're a young person wanting to get into working with elephants, I mean, you learn as much as you can, study as much as you can. Um, I'm learning things about elephants every day, and I've been, you know, with them for most of my life. And it, it just seems it's endless what we need to, to know about them and and to help uh, preserve and, and protect them. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the big thing. You just have to develop that that passion for them, and and that there's really there's not too much that you can do for them. That you know that they really need us. They really need us, and um, I, I guess appreciation for um, hard work. I mean, because it is it is it's hard work and um but it's it's worth it when you can see the elephants that's very true um so let's go back to some more questions in the chat people are very interested in the research work that your herd has done charlie um mm -hmm. and with all the babies born they're asking about what you've done with respect to EHV and um, if you've had any cases, yes, we've 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 had cases. Um, we we have had a, a couple losses that were very hard to go through, and it's it's a very very tough fight. Um, but we've also had some some really good survivor stories as well, um, and I think you know we can contribute a lot to to learning about EHB. Um, we monitor our elephants weekly um, through blood sampling. Um, and we have a we have a, a PCR lab that we can detect the virus if we you know if we have some going through. Um, we've also um, some of the things that we we, we do weekly uh, complete blood counts and biochemistry on the elephants as well. And lately, some of our research has been to look at a lot of those blood parameters and see if there's statistically going through it, see if there's some early um, changes in, in the blood work that we can sort of maybe tip off um, that we've got a case coming and that we can be a little bit more proactive on, on that. Um, we also, uh, again, with the infrared uh, thermography, we have been uh, trying to see if that, if when an elephant is early in viremia, if there is some heat signatures that they might be giving off um, in different areas and, and things like that. So, yeah, and we're very involved in the um, EHV uh, group um, so yeah, it's, it's something that we're, we're very interested in, in getting rid of this horrible disease. Absolutely. And Charlie's work with IEF, IEF has, um, earmarked EHV research as one of our funding priorities since nearly the discovery of the disease. And Charlie has really led the charge in selecting projects and helping, uh, determine where the, that funding goes so that we can really, really spearhead the development of vaccine for EHB, different tests, all the things, almost all of the advances 
that we've made toward EHB. So Charlie's really been passionate about that and leading the charge within IEF. Um, someone's asking, Charlie, can you talk a little bit about Asian elephant conservation in range countries? Since you were in Vietnam recently, maybe you can tell us. Yeah, I was, uh, that's an interesting story. Um, so I was invited to um, participate in a workshop in, in Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam um, is one of the 13 range states that uh, has Asian elephants. And as far as we know, because the estimates are very, uh, for population estimates are, are not very um, accurate or, or they're very difficult to do. Um, and it, it was believed that Vietnam, you know, had the lowest population of, of Asian elephants in any range country. Um, but recently in a, in a reserve um, in the Central Highlands, um, the, the, the topography makes it very difficult to see the elephants. And it's, um, they really had no idea how many elephants were there. Um, they thought maybe 10 elephants, um, maybe less. Um, but they were able to uh, establish a camera trap program where they were able to identify, it, photograph and identify individual elephants. And now it looks like that small little range there has 27 elephants and it seems to be a growing population. Um, there were young elephants or baby elephants. So um, that looks very promising. Um, and it was a really um, beneficial workshop because local Vietnamese um, conservationists and the Vietnamese government seem to be very committed to wanting to protect these elephants and wanting to uh, establish more um, investigation into how many elephants there are and whether there would be a possibility to connect, connect them to other populations of elephants in Vietnam. So. It didn't see, you know, it, it wasn't a doom and gloom story, that's for sure. So it was, it, it was a nice, promising story that hopefully that we can keep elephants in Vietnam for future generations. And that's really great because I know for a lot, number of years, everyone sort of thought Vietnam might have been lost to elephants. So that's yeah. hopeful. Yeah. yeah. And that would be a real tragedy tragedy too because that would be the first range state um, in modern history that's you know lost their elephants so yeah hopefully we'll be able to do some positive work there absolutely um amos we have some more questions for you first yes. can you tell us a little bit about the communities where you work um is there a lot of human elephant conflict in the area? What kind of, um, what's the source of income for the people in that community? Is it primarily subsistence farmers? Things like that. Can you tell us a little bit more? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. The community where I'm working with, it's all mainly subsistence farming. Yeah, because Wanke area is a dry region and they rely on underground water, even for food, domestic use for gardening. So the main, main activity is cattle breeding. So most of the communities, they have got a lot of cattles. And the issue about human elephant conflict is not very much uh, per se, because mostly there are no fields to be destroyed by the elephants, except on community gardens. So what we have done from the community projects I did, we developed chili bombs by growing chilies around the, the gardens. So the community will then make chili bombs. So Human elephant conflicts on plants is very little. 
there are isolated incidents like the recent incident whereby a human being is killed by an elephant, but they are very isolated. But elephants, they do move from the protected area into the community because the protected areas, they are not fenced. So the elephants can move in and out of the protected area. So that's the situation in Zimbabwe and with the community I work with. Thank you. And so in Zimbabwe, do most children go to school? Are they taught about wildlife conservation in that school? Yes, most school children, they are taught, uh, but surprisingly, you can find school children who are uh, less than a kilometer from the park. They don't know the park. They've never been given the opportunity to enter into the protected area. So those are some of the community projects I did from what I have discussed, taking uh, some community ch children into the park. Now the demand was very high. So I am now doing it like as a prize to say the best uh, students, number one and number two from grade one up to seven, they will have a free entry into the park. So those are some of the projects I am doing to educate and to arm the school children about wildlife conservation. It's fit that the authorities, they demand payments, even from those school children, even from the communities around the protected area. So if the kids live so close to the park, how come they haven't been in? How come they haven't seen wildlife? They see some elephants, like elephants, which roam into the community. They know the elephants, they know the lions, but there are other animal species, like wange, there is a, a lot of wildlife in the park. So some of the animals, they don't see, but elephants, lions, they see them in the community when they stray into the community. Okay. But to them, those animals, they will not be friendly. So the kids will run away from them because they are a potential danger to them. That makes sense. And so what can we as individuals in the United States and Europe do to help the community? Aside from the work you do, what kind of support does the community need? Right. Thank you very much for that one. The community, they need, they need things like books, right? Those who have um, access to books, even ballpoints, uh, stationary, uniforms, and also to improve to the community projects, like donating like things like sewing machines for the community, for the less privileged, for the women in the community so that they start projects of, for example, making uh, uniforms and resell those uniforms at a cheaper price. So that is how the communities in UK can assist even second-hand clothing. If you are to visit Zimbabwe one day, move around the community, you feel sorry of the community. They are dressing. So the embassies will be, this is from wildlife conservationists, whatever is donated. I will say this is from wildlife conservationists so that the community appreciate the value of wildlife. What well, they say, it is from the conservationists. That's how why I get this shoe. That's why I that's why I get this solar solar powered lights. For example, there is a a donor who donated solar-powered lights for school children to, to read. They were not made, they were 200, but it makes a lot of difference. So anything which you can think of, which is valuable to human being, is most accepted in Zimbabwe. Thank you very much. That's great to know. And I think it gives a lot of 
thought for, or gives a lot of things for people to think about. Uh, going back to why don't the people or the kids go into the park? Or is there, uh, is it just because they don't have the funds to be able to pay the park fees? Is it because they're afraid of the wildlife? Um, do And do you think it's important for them to see elephants and wildlife in the park in a in a safe way? Thank you very much. First, they don't go into the park because they don't afford the park fees, right? Second, when you go, you need a motor vehicle to move around, seeing those animals. So it is also a cost. It is paid for. So the community, they don't afford that. So what I usually do with my small bag, I will take the community, especially the school children. As I say, I am doing that through screening to say those who are academically gifted, you have a prize of going into Wange National Park uh, for a day, uh, driven, given some soft drinks, having a professional guide who will teach the communities even the habits of wildlife. Because a professional guide will teach to say the behavior of the elephant is like this. If you see an elephant doing this, it means this. If you see an elephant doing this, it means it is now angry, so that they will also take that knowledge and impart to others. So it is very good and formal for the school children to go into the park where they learn from experienced guides. And then they will also use that knowledge to teach others. That makes perfect sense. So, so you think that when the kids go into the park and see elephants in person, that it teaches them, but they can also use that information to teach other people. Definitely, yes. That's because very... the, the guide, the guide, for example, the guide will say, if you see an elephant doing this, this is a mock charge. The elephant is not angry. But there are some studies done to say this is a mock charge. Now this is a serious charge. So they will use that knowledge also to teach others when they go back to school. Very cool. And that, yes. that goes back to what Charlie was saying earlier about how the importance of having people see elephants in person, whether it's at a zoo or in a, in a wildlife park, how it affects their lives and helps them understand elephants. Definitely, yes. Uh, and someone is asking in the chat, so what is the cost per person or per trip of the park fees? Uh, so if we wanted to donate, say, park fees for a family to go into the park, what would that amount be? Right. Uh, I will take the figures charged by national parks, right, for the locals, anyone who is... Uh, between nine and 12 will pay $2 to enter. Anyone who is above 12 will pay $5 entry fees right, per person. Then, oh, I think we for, lost, oh, there you are, you're back. Yes, so I'm, I was saying it's $2 for those who is nine years to 12 years, then $5 for those above 12 years, plus uh, vehicle hire fees, which include professional guides, which is $30 per person. That wow. is for a period of three hours. That is extremely affordable. Uh, and I think, I think there's definitely donors in the United States who is who are interested in supporting that kind of thing. Um, Thank you. So we will we will connect something like that. Uh, Charlie, going back to you, we had some questions about some of your other 
work that you have done, either going to range countries. So you went to a train workshop in India. Maybe you can yeah. talk about that. Or um, I know you visited Myanmar and have been involved in some other range country conservation. Any of that you would like to? Sure, have? sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've been, because I'm so interested in elephants, um, I, I've been to um, many range countries um, for different projects. Um, for example, in um, 2018, there was a workshop in West Bengal, India. Um, so they, the infrastructure of the railway there um, changed where the um, gauge of the railway was um, expanded to be wider. So that increased the speed of the trains that were traveling through elephant habitat. And as a result, there were um, many um, elephants being hit by trains uh, causing fatalities. Um, and it was something that, um, you know, everybody was very concerned about. So we were able to um, gather together um, officials from the railway department, from the wildlife department, from um, different NGOs, and and really focus on this pro uh, on this problem, um, and came up with some different strategies. We were able to find out like when the train strikes were most likely to happen, um, what were some of the contributing factors, and and sort of use those parameters to to change sort of the operation of the railway a little bit and as a result of those meetings um, since 2018 as far as i know um, my last communication um, in 2019 there were very very few um, accidents and from 2020 onwards um, they there have been no strikes and part of the solutions that we we've sort of came up with was that identifying where it was most likely that the, the train was going to encounter elephants and then to slow the speed at those parts of, of the track and also to, you know, maybe make some more, um, you know, train whistles um, just so the elephants would know that the trains were coming. Um, and then just making, making just the drivers more aware that they are going to be, you know, probably they have to be more um, aware of the fact that that there is wildlife on these on these train lines, and they they really have to um, um, make you know preparation for that. But it, it's also interesting too because I think part of the, the elephants are so intelligent that I think. Overall, they've adjusted to increase speed of the trains, so they know that okay, I hear a train coming. I don't have a lot of time. I've got to cross this track. Um, so they're very, very adaptable as well. So I think they've adjusted. You know, it's been a lot of human um, taking the elephants into consideration, but I think there's been a lot of learning on the elephants' parts too. So that was that was a very, very interesting, very beneficial. Um, workshop that we that we held um, and also some of the interesting work that we've we've worked with for um, the um, elephant uh, response units in Sumatra and in in Myanmar where um, elephants under human care um, they've expanded their you know traditional roles where they can be more or less they can monitor the forests. They can monitor for um, protected areas for illegal activities such as poaching or illegal logging, illegal settling, um, things like that. Uh, and, and in a lot of these areas, there, there's not vehicle access to these areas. So patrolling on elephants is, is by far the easiest way to get along through there. And at the same time, they're also... Um, the rangers that are, have been um, trained for these patrols are, are also looking for signs of other endangered species, whether it's tiger, whether it's orangutan, whether it's 
you know, rhino. Um, and so they can they can monitor the, the wildlife in the area and then also um, track them these areas um, by GPS and hopefully influence um, governments to pro better protect these areas from illegal wildlife activity. So, so yeah, that's been been very beneficial too. So, um, but yeah, the IEF is very connected to a lot of um, sort of interface between elephants and people because in Asia, and I mean, just like Amos was talking about as well, um, one of the biggest problems is is human elephant conflict and one of the strategies that that we try to implement um, with IEF is to go from human elephant conflict to coexistence because elephants and humans are going to share space they're they're going to be in the same areas you can't move the humans out you can't move the elephants out so we have to really think long and hard about how elephants and humans can coexist uh, without conflict. And I think that's a real challenge. And we've got a lot of really good people working on that, like Amos. So I'm really happy that I was able to be on this with Amos, because I really appreciate all of the work that he does in Zimbabwe as well. Well, I think that is the absolute perfect way to end this morning session because uh, we're about at the hour mark. And I think, Charlie, you really encapsulated IEF and our vision perfectly. And we are so happy to support great work of people like Amos on, on his birthday, no less. So we are very happy to have you both here and Thank you for everyone who attended and asked such insightful questions. Um, you are what makes IEF go. You are the engine that powers all of the work that we do. So on days like today, like Giving Tuesday, we like to bring you a little closer to the conservation work that's being done. We like to connect you with the actual people in the field. So we are thankful for all of you. And of course, if you wanna support work like Amos's or the research projects Charlie's talked about, please donate to IEF. The link is in the chat and you all know our website. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. And as a reminder, we have happy hour this evening, uh, 3 p.m. Pacific time. So not quite happy hour for, for my side of the world, but show up with your cocktails and we will have a more another discussion about conservation and elephants. Julie? I just want to thank everybody for being on here. I see so many of our regular donors and supporters on the line today. And as Sarah mentioned, Amos and Charlie, they're the engine, but truly our supporters and donors are the gasoline that makes that engine run. So um, thank you so much for joining us on Giving Tuesday. And um, if you would like to donate, of course, the, the link has been in the chat, and we just truly appreciate all of you, each and every one of you. So thank you so much, and we hope to see you tonight during our happy hour, as Sarah said, at 3 p.m. Pacific, uh, 5 p.m. Central. So hopefully we'll see some of you again this evening. Thank you so much.